Welcome back. In a new book, Donna Brazil, who took over as interim chair of the Democratic National Committee after Debbie Wasserman Schultz was forced out in the summer of 2016, offers a stinging critique of Wasserman Schultz. Debbie was not a good manager. She hadn't been very interested in controlling the party. She let Clinton's headquarters in Brooklyn do as it desired, so she didn't have to inform the party officers how bad the situation was. Brazil wrote she was shocked to learn the DNC had taken out a loan, and yet Wasserman Schultz Schultz never informed DNZ officials like herself. That was just Debbie's way. In my experience, she didn't come to the officers of the DNC for advice and counsel. She seemed to make decisions on her own and let us know at the last minute what she had decided. And as Brazil dug deeper into the DNC's finances, she said she found a smoking gun, a so-called victory fund agreement between the DNC and the Clinton campaign that gave the Clinton folks complete control of the DNC. More than a year before she actually won the nomination. The victory fund agreement was not illegal, but it sure looked unethical. If the fight had been fair, one campaign would not have control of the party before the voters had decided which one they wanted to lead. This was not a criminal act, but as I saw it, it compromised the party's integrity. Brazil said she called Bernie Sanders to inform him what she found. She said when she finished the call, she broke down in tears, not out of guilt, she said, but out of anger. Joining me this morning to talk about Brazil's claims as well as the bizarre goings on in Tallahassee in recent weeks is Politico's own Mark Caputo. Mark, so just more good news for Debbie Wasserman Schultz as Donna Brazil buries her. Right, I think it's like there's a bus leaving at noon, Debbie, be under it, is what, <laughs> what Donna basically said. But let's not give Donna Brazil too much credit for rooting out the suspicious stuff. One of my former colleagues at Politico, Ken Vogel, had unearthed how the Clinton campaign was using the DNC finances to funnel money from the states through the DNC, essentially ultimately into the control of the Clinton campaign. So this isn't really new stuff. What's new is that Donna Brazil suddenly cares about it now that she has a book. Well, it also is new, though, the fact that the Clinton campaign had complete control of hiring decisions, messaging. Yep. Every, I mean, it's one thing to take money, but it's also basically she had him on a short leash and she controlled, Clinton's folks controlled every aspect of the DNC more than a year before she got the nomination. Yeah, newsflash. Clinton's campaign essentially lied or deceived people. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz essentially lied or deceived people. Does this have any impact on her race in 2018? I doubt it because she has a very safe district. She already had a challenger once in Tim Canova in the Democratic primary, like her first in a quarter century. She handily beat him. But, you know, he's going to run against her again. I'm just not sure how much this translates All into right. her district. Let's turn to Tallahassee. I, I, I'm just fascinated by what's going on. We've seen one state senator resign after admitting to an affair with a lobbyist. Another state representative resign when she was caught not living in her district and lying about it. We have private investigators are, are apparently running all over Tallahassee, videotaping, you know, members of the Senate kissing other people in parking lots. What is going on in Tallahassee, Mark Caputo? That's just one week. That's, That's one week. week of what's going on in Tallahassee. This is, uh, you know, it's something in the water. I don't really know. Understand that Tallahassee has long had a reputation. I think years ago, the Miami New Times wrote a story and they quoted a legislator saying that Miami is for the wives and Tallahassee is for the girlfriends. And so that gives you an idea of some of these guys think they're on spring break permanently when they're up there. And some of that stuff is catching up with them. So you have State Senator Jeff Clemens, uh, who resigned his seat after we reported he had an extramarital affair with a lobbyist and more women were kind of coming forward. You also had uh the, there's a case of State Senator Jack Latvala who's been tailed, or, uh, I guess pun intended, uh, by private investigators who are looking for sexual misconduct with him. They did photograph him kissing a lobbyist. You and then he, then he actually denied committing sexual harassment when he hadn't been asked if he had committed sexual harassment. Yes, yeah, specifically our reporter Alexandra Glorioso asked him, is there a sexual harassment problem in the Florida Senate? He's like, I, I never sexually harass anyone. It's like, well, we didn't ask you that, <laughs> Senator. And we might file that under a guilty conscience needs no accuser file, but we're going to have to fully report this out to, to know whether that's true or not. I've talked to, and, and the issue of, it's funny, I'll admit that I got that you beat me on this because I had the, the FDLE report. I know you did. I don't know why you didn't report it. I found that out. I'm sorry to break it here to you live. <laughs> no, no. I, in part because I couldn't make the connection to whether or not it was behind Artillus. So, and I still don't know that there is a strong connection that shows that it's Artillus. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, State Senator Oscar Brandon said he's heard rumors that it was Artillus, but we don't know. So, my, my question though is, 
with all this going on, with private investigators running around, a sense of paranoia, legislators I talk to seem to wonder, will anything really get done in Tallahassee this year? Yeah, they are constitutionally required to balance a budget. So that's it? Yeah, that's it. Uh, except every 10 years they have to do this, uh, right. the reapportionment. But I'm saying, I mean, is there is there such a level of paranoia and distrust in Tallahassee that it's going to be even more poisonous than normal? The main problem that Tallahassee has had has actually been tensions in the Republican Party between the House and the Senate. I don't see those necessarily going away. It's an election year. House Speaker Richard Corcoran is likely to run for governor, and State Senator Jack Latvala is running for governor, and those two have been at loggerheads for quite some time. I'm not sure that the suggestions, proof, evidence, rumors of impropriety that are extracurricular, extra to the lawmaking process, are really going to affect it anymore. In the end, it just kind of adds an extra of intrigue and sleaze to Tallahassee, which probably needs to clean up its act. So let's just turn briefly to the governor's race on the time that we've got remaining. We, ha we had Andrew Gillum on in the first block of this show. Uh, Mayor Philip Levine officially announced, although he's been running for months. You know, <laughs> worst kept secret in Exactly. Politics, right? You know, you've got Gwen Graham on the Democratic side. You've got Andrew King on the Democratic side. You've mentioned some of the Republicans, Adam Putnam as well on the Republicans. This is a wide open race. How do you see it shaping up this far out? I think it is a wide open race. The name you didn't mention, incidentally, I think it's Chris King, Chris King, uh, sorry, businessman from Orlando. Yeah. The name you didn't mention is Ron DeSantis. He is a Northeast Florida congressman. He's a Republican. A Republican. He's likely to get into the GOP primary, and I think he's a real contender there. It, you, preliminary evidence suggests that Gwen Graham is probably the early front runner in the Democratic primary, but it's Florida. You know, we have a history of very close elections. Sometimes they don't even know who won the election after Election Day, mm -hmm. so we probably want to get a little closer to know a little more. And the Senate race. Obviously, we're, everyone's paying attention to what's going to happen between, <laughs> between Rick Scott and Bill Nelson. All the polls show this is a dead even race right now. They do show it's a dead even race right now. Which isn't a good sign for Nelson. Well, it's a worse sign for Nelson because these are registered voter polls that are not reflective of what the electorate looks like. If you model those very polls showing a dead heat to reflect a general midterm election turnout, Nelson's losing. He's not just tied with Rick Scott, he's losing. And if you look at all these other polls, Rick Scott for the first time is above water, above the 50% mark, or at the 50% mark in his approval rating. That's really great news for him. Is that, do you think a large part of that is the way he was so present during the storm? I think so. Now, he does get credit for handling the run-up to the storm, but after the storm, he has had a lot of problems kind of nag his administration. The state's Department of Children and Families doesn't look like it administered the D-SNAP, that is the, the, the food stamp. Mm -hmm program in a disaster very efficiently. There have been questions about how prepared the Department of Emergency Management Debris is. Debris removal, which we've raised here on this show. Right. It was a fantastic report with, with Randy Perkins, right, mm -hmm. the, the former sure. congressional candidate. He pointed out that Rick Scott kind of came in and gave a no-bid contract, and boy, that was a lot of that's money. The, that's the secret of, of storms. You can be good on the up front side, but it's the back side. It's, it's that, it's that what, what happens after the storm passes that really can bite you. I think that's the real story for any hurricane. Everyone's always worried like, oh, the hurricane's going to hit. It's like, it's not really the hurricane, it's the aftermath. Mark Caputo, always great having you in. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know you're hungry, so we'll let you go get something to eat. Oh.